Malfoy bent down to examine a shelf full of skulls. Everybody thinks he's so smart. Wonderful Potter with his scar and his broomstick. You have told me that at least a dozen times already, said Mr. Malfoy, with a quelling look at his son. And I would remind you that it is not prudent to appear less than fond of Harry Potter. Not when most of our kind regard him as the hero who made the Dark Lord disappear. Ah, Mr. Borgen. A stooping man had appeared behind the counter, smoothing his greasy hair back from his face. Mr. Malfoy. What a pleasure it is to see you again, said Mr. Borgen in a voice as oily as his hair. Delighted, and a young Mr. Mal Master Malfoy too. Charmed, how may I be of assistance? I must show you, just in today, very reasonably priced. I'm not buying today, Mr. Borgen, but selling, said Mr. Malfoy. Selling, said Mr. Borgen, the smile fading from his face. You have heard, of course, that the Ministry is conducting more raids, says Mr. Malfoy, taking a roll of parchment from in his inside pocket and unravelling it for Mr. Borgen to read. I have a few uh, items that may come to embarrass me if the Ministry were to call. Mr. Borgen fi fixed a prince as to his nose and looked down the list. The Ministry wouldn't presume to sh trouble you, sure, sure, sir, surely. Mr. Malfoy's lip curled. I have not been visited yet. The name Malfoy still commands a certain level of respect. Yet the ministry goes ever more meddlesome. There are rumours about a new muggle protection at. No doubt a flea-bitten muggle-loving fool Arthur Weasley is behind it. Harry felt a hot surge of anger. As you see, these poisons might make it appear... I understand, sir, of course, said Mr. Borgen. Let me see. Can I have that? interrupted Draco, pointing at a withered hand on the cushion. Ah, the hand of glory, said Mr. Borgen, abandoning Mr. Malfoy's lists and scurrying over to Draco. Insert a candle, and it gives light only for the holder. Best friend of thieves and plunderers. Your son has fine taste, sir. I hope that my son will amount to more than a thief or a plunderer, Borgen, said Mr. Malfoy coldly. And Mr. Borgen says quickly, no offence, sir, no offence met, meant. Though, if this school marks don't, uh, if his school marks don't pick up, said Mr. Malfoy more coldly, that may indeed be all he is fit for. It's not my fault, retorted Draco. The teachers all have favourites, that Hermione Granger. I would have thought you would be ashamed that a girl of no wizard family might beat you in every exam, snapped Mr. Malfoy. Ha, ah, said Harry under his breath, pleased to see that Draco looked both abashed and angry. It's the same all over, said Mr. Morgan, his oily voice. Miss Wizard blood is counting for less and less everywhere we go. Not with me, said Mr. Malfoy, his long nostrils flaring. No, sir, nor with me, said Mr. Borgen, in a, be in a deep vow, vow. In that case, perhaps we can return to my list, said Mr. Malfoy shortly. I am in certain, I am in something of a hurry, Borgen. I have more business elsewhere today. They started to haggle. Harry watched nervously as Draco drew nearer and nearer to his hiding place, examining the objects for sale. He paused to examine a long coil of hangman's rope and to read, smirking, the car the card that was propped up on a magnificent necklace of opals. Caution, do not touch, cursed, has claimed the lives of nineteen muggle owners to date. Draco turned away and saw the cabinet right in front of him. He walked forward. He stretched out his hand for the handle. Done, said Mr. Malfoy at the counter. Come along, Draco. Harry wiped his forehead on his sleeve as Draco turned away. Good day to you, Mr. Borgen. I expect to see you at the manor tomorrow to pick up, pick up the goods. The moment the door had closed, Mr. Borgen dropped his oily manner. Good day to yourself, Mr. Malfoy. And if the stories are true, you should—you haven't sold me half of what is hidden in your manor. 
Muttering darkly, Mr. Morgan disappeared into the back room. Harry waited for a minute in, the ca in case he came back, then quickly as he could slipped out of the cabinet, past the glass cases and out the shop door. Clutching his broken glasses to his face, he stared around. He had emerged into a dingy alleyway that seemed to be made up entirely of shops devoted to the dark arts. The one he'd just left, Borgen and Burks, looked like the largest, but opposite was a nasty window display of shrunken heads, and two doors down, a large cage was alive, alive with, white, with gigantic black spiders. Two shabby-looking wizards were watching him from the shadow of a doorway, muttering to each other. Feeling jumpy, Harry set off, trying to hold his glasses on straight, and hoping against hope that he'd be able to find a way out of there. The old wooden street sign hanging over the shop selling poisonous candles told him that he was in a place called Nocturne Alley. This didn't help, as Harry had never even heard of such a place. He supposed he hadn't, spoke, hadn't spoken clearly through his mouthful of ashes in the Weasley's fire. Trying to stay calm, he wondered what to do. Not lost, are you, dear? said a voice in his ear, making him jump. An old witch stood in front of him, holding a tray of looked horribly like whole human fingernails. She leered at him, showing mossy teeth, and Harry backed away. I'm fine, thanks. I'm just... Harry! What do you think you're doing down there? Harry's heart leapt. So did the witch. A load of fingernails cascaded down over her feet. And she cursed as the massive form of Hagrid, the Hogwarts gamekeeper, came striding towards them. Beetle black eyes flashing over his great bristling beard. Hagrid, Harry croaked in relief. I was lost. Flu powder. Hagrid seized Harry by the scruff of the neck and pulled him away from the witch, knocking the tray right out of her hands. Her shrieks followed them all the way along the twisting alleyway and out into the bright sunlight. Harry saw a familiar snow-white marble building in the distance. Gringotts Bank, Harry had... Gringotts Bank. Harry had steered him... Hagrid had steered him right into Diagon Alley. You're a mess, said Hagrid gruffly, brushing soot off Harry so forcefully that he nearly knocked him into a barrel of dragon poo outside the apothecaries. Skulking around Nocturne Alley. I don't know. Dodgy place, Harry. You don't want no one to see you down there. I realise that, said Harry, ducking, as Hagrid made to brush him off again. I told you, I was lost. What were you doing down there anyway? I was looking for flesh-eating slug repellent, growled Hagrid. They're ruined school cabbages. You're not on your own. I'm staying with the Weasleys, but we got separated, Harry explained. I've got to go and find them. They set off together down the street. How come you never wrote back to me, said Hagrid, as Harry log jogged along beside him. He had to take three steps for every time Hagrid took a giant step with his big boots. Harry explained all about Dobby and the Dursleys. Ruddy muggles, growled Hagrid. If I'd known. Harry, Harry, over here. Harry looked and saw Hermione standing on top of a white flight of steps up to Gringotts. She ran down to meet them, her bushy brown hair flying behind her. What happened to your glasses? Hello, Hagrid. Oh, it's wonderful to see you two again. Are you coming to Gringotts, Harry? As soon as I've found the Weasleys. Well, you won't have long to wait, grinned Hagrid. Harry and Hermione looked around, sprinting up the crowded street were Ron, Fred, George, Percy and Mr. Weasley. Harry, Mr. Weasley panted. We hoped you'd only gone one grade too far. He mopped his glistening bald patch. Mon Molly's been frantic. She's coming now. Where did you come out? Ron asked. Nocturne Alley, said Hagrid grimly. Brilliant, said Fred and George together. We've never been allowed in, said Ron enviously. Well, I should really well think not, growled Hagrid. Mrs. Weasley now came galloping into view, her handbag swinging wildly in one hand and Ginny clinging on to the other. Oh, Harry, oh, my dear, you could have been anywhere. Gra gasping for breath, she pulled a large clothes brush out of her bag and began sweeping the soot Hagrid hadn't managed to beat away. Miss Mr. Weasley took Harry's glasses, gave them a tap of his wand and returned them good as new. We gotta be off, said Hagrid, who's been who, 
having his who was having his hand wrung out by Mrs. Weasley. See you at Hogwarts. He t- he strode away, a head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the whole street. Guess who I saw at Borgen and Burke's? Harry asked Ron, and Hermione as they climbed the steps to Gringotts. Malfoy and his father. Did Lucius Malfoy buy anything? Said Mister Weasley sharply behind them. No, he's selling. So he's worried, said Mr. Weasley with a grim satisfaction. Oh, I'd love to catch Lucius Malfoy for something. You be careful, Arthur, said Mrs. Weasley sharply, as they were ushered into the bank by a bowing goblin at the door. That family's trouble. Don't you go biting off more than you can chew. So you don't think I'm a match for Lucius Malfoy, said Mr. Weasley indignantly, but they were distracted almost at once by the sight of Hermione's parents, who were standing nervously at the counter that ran all along the great marble hall, waiting for Hermione to introduce them. But you're muggles, said Mr. Weasley delightedly. We must have a drink. What's that you've got there? Oh my goodness, you're changing muggle money. Molly, look. He pointed excitedly at a ten-pound note in Mr. Mr. Granger's hand. Meet you back there, said Ron. Uh, Ron said to Hermione as the Weasleys and Harry were led off to the underground vaults by another Gringotts goblin. The vaults were reached by means of a small goblin-driven cart that sped along the miniature train tracks all through the banks of underground tunnels. Harry enjoyed the breakneck journey down to the Weasleys' vault, but felt dreadful, far worse than he had in Nocturne Alley, when it was opened. There was a very small pile of silver sickles inside, and just one gold galleon. Mrs. Weasley felt right to the corners before sweeping the whole lot into her bag. Harry felt worse when he reached his own vault. He tried to block the contents from view as he hastily shoved handfuls of coins into a leather bag. Back outside the marble steps, they were all separate. They all separated. Percy muttered vaguely about needing a new quill. Fred and George had spotted their friend from Hogwarts, Lee Jordan and Mrs. Weasley and Ginny were going for a second-hand robe shop. Mrs. Mr. Weasley was insisting on taking the Grangers off to the leaky cauldron for a drink. We'll all meet at Flourish and Blots in an hour to buy your school books, said Mrs. Weasley, setting off with Ginny. And not one step down Nocturne Alley, she shouted at the, tre- at the twins' retreating backs. Harry, Ron and Hermione strolled off the winding cobbled street, The bag of gold, silver and bronze, jangling cheerfully in Harry's pocket, was clamouring to be spent. So he brought three large strawberry and peanut butter ice creams that they they slurped happily as they wandered down the alley, examining the fascinating shop windows. Ron gazed longingly at a full set of Chudley Cannon robes in the windows of quality Quidditch supplies until Hermione dragged him off to buy ink and parchment next door. In Gamble and Jape's wizarding joke shop, they met Fred, George and Lee, Bo- Lee Jordan, who were stocking up on Dr. Filibuster's fabulous wet start no heat fireworks, and a tiny junk shop full of broken wands, wonky brass scales and old cloaks covered in potion stains. They found Percy deeply immersed in a small and deeply boring book called Prefects Who Gained Power, A study of Hogwarts prefects and their later careers. Ron read aloud off the back of the cover. That sounds fascinating. Go away, Percy snapped. Of course, he's very ambitious, Percy. He's got it all planned out. He wants to be Minister of Magic. Ron told Harry and Hermione in an undertone as they left Percy to it. An hour later, they headed for Flourish and Blots. They were by no means the only ones making their way to the bookshop, and as they approached, it was t- they saw to their surprise that there was a large crowd gathering outside the doors, jostling to get in. The reason they for this was proclaimed in a large banner stretched across the upper window. Gilderoy Lockhart will be signing copies of his autobiography, Magical Me, today at 12.30 to 4.30. We can actually meet him, Hermione squealed. I mean, he's written most of our book list. The crowd seemed made up mostly of witches around Mrs. Weasley age, 
a harassed looking wizard stood, was stood at the door saying calmly please ladies don't push there might no, no, don't push there mind the books Harry, Ron and Hermione squeezed inside. A long queue went right to the back of the shop where Gilderoy Lockhart himself was signing books. They each gra- grabbed a copy of Break with the Banshee and sneaked up the line to the rest of the Weasleys where they were, where they were standing with Mr and Mrs Granger. Oh, there you are. Good, said Mrs Weasley. She sounded breathless and kept patting her hair. We'll see, we'll see him in a minute. Gilderoy Lockhart came slowly into view, seated at a table surrounded by large pictures of his own face, all winking and flashing dazzlingly white teeth at the crowd. The real Lockhart was wearing robes of forget-me-not blue, which exactly matched his eyes, and his pointed wizard hat was set at a jaunty ankle on his wavy hair. A short, irritable-looking man was dancing around taking photographs with a large black camera, that emitted puffs of purple smoke with every blinding flash. Out of the way there, he snarled at Ron, moving back to get a better shot. This is for the Daily Prophet. Big deal, said Ron, rubbing his foot where the, photogra- where the photographer had stepped on it. Gilderoy Lockhart heard him, looked up. He saw Ron, and then he saw Harry. He stared, and then leapt at his feet, and positively shouted, it can't be. Harry Potter? The crowd parted, whispering excitedly, and Lockhart dived forward and seized Harry's arm and pulled him to the front. The, ca- the crowd burst into applause. Harry's face burned as Lockhart shook his hand for the photographer, who was clicking away madly, wafting smoke over the, dirt, over the Weasleys. Nice big smile, Harry, said Lockhart through his own gleaming t- t- teeth. Together, you and I are worth the front page. When he finally let go of Harry's hand, Harry could hardly feel his fingers. He tried to sidle back over to the Weasleys, but Lockhart threw an arm around his shoulder and clamped him tightly to his, sh- to his side. Ladies and gentlemen, he said loudly, waving for quiet, what an extraordinary moment this is. The perfect moment for me to make a little announcement that I've been sitting on for some time. When young Harry here stepped into Flourish and Blots today, he only wanted to buy my autobiography, which I shall happily now present to him, free of charge. The crowd applauded again. He had no idea, Lockhart continued, giving Harry a little shake that made his glasses slip to the end of his nose. That he would, be get, that he would shortly be getting much, much more than my book, Magical Me. He and his schoolfellows will, in fact, be getting the real magical me. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have the great pleasure and pride of announcing that this September I will be taking up the post of Defence Against the Dark Arts teacher at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The crowd cheered and clapped Harry and and Harry found himself being presented with the entire work of Gilderoy Lockhart. Staggering slightly under the weight, he managed to make his way out of the limelight to the edge of the room, where Ginny was standing next to her new cauldron. You have these, Harry mumbled to her, tipping the books into the cauldron. I'll buy my own. But you love that, didn't you, Potter? said a, said a voice that Harry had no uh, trouble recognising. He straightened up and found himself face to face with Draco Malfoy, who was wearing his usual sneer. Famous Harry Potter. Can't go even to a can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. Leave him alone. He didn't want all of that, said Ginny. It was the first time that she'd actually said a word in front of Harry. She was glaring at Malfoy. Potter, you've got yourself a girlfriend, drawled Malfoy. Ginny went scarlet, and Ron and Hermione fought their way over, both clutching bo- clutching stacks of Lockhart's books. Oh, it's you, said Ron, looking at Malfoy, as if he were something unpleasant on the sole of his shoe. Bet you're surprised to see Harry here, eh? Not as surprised as I am to see you in a shop, Weasley, retorted Malfoy. I suppose your parents will go hungry for a month to pay for that lot. Ron went as red as Ginny. He dropped his book into the cauldron too, and walked towards Malfoy, but Harry and Hermione grabbed to the back of his jacket. Ron, said Mr Weasley, struggling over to Fred and George. What are you doing? 
It's mad in here. Let's go outside. Well, well, well. Arthur Weasley. It was Mr. Malfoy. He stepped... He stood with his hands on Draco's shoulder, sneering in just the same way. Lucius, said Mr. Weasley, nodding coldly. Busy time in the ministry, I hear, said Mr. Malfoy. All those raids. I hope they're paying you overtime. He reached into Ginny's cauldron and extracted from extracted from amidst the glossy Lockhart books a very old, very tattered copy of A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration. Obviously not. Dear me, what's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard and they don't even pay you well for it? Mr. Weasley flushed darker than either Ron or Ginny. We have a very idea, a very different idea of what disgraces the name of wizards, Malfoy. Clearly, said Mr. Malfoy, his eyes straying to Mr. and Mrs. Granger, who were watching him apprehensively. The company you keep, Weasley. I thought your family could sink no lower. There was a thud of metal as Ginny's cauldron went flying and Mr. Weasley had thrown himself at Mr. Malfoy, knocking him backwards into a bookshelf. Dozens of heavy spell books came thundering down on their heads and there was a yell of, Get him, Dad! from Fred and George. Mrs. Weasley was shrieking, No, Arthur, no! And the crowd stampeded backwards, knocking more shelves over. Gentlemen, please, please, cried the assistants, and then louder, Break it up there, gents, break it up! Hagrid was wading through the sea of books, and in an instant he had pulled Mr. Weasley and Mr. Malfoy apart. Mr. Weasley had a cut lip, and Mr. Malfoy had been hit in the eye by an encyclopedia of toadstools. He was holding Ginny's old transfiguration book, and he thrust it at her, his eyes glittering with malice. Here, girl, take your book. It's the best your father can give you. Pulling himself out of Hagrid's grip, he beckoned to Draco and swept out of the shop. Oh, you should have ignored him, Arthur, said Hagrid, almost lifting Mr. Weasley off his feet as he straightened his robes. Rotten to the core, that whole family. Everyone knows that. No Malfoy's worth listening to. Bad bloods, that's what it is. Now come out, come on now, let's get out of here. The assistant looked as though he wanted to stop them leaving, but he barely came up to Hagrid's waist and seemed to think better of it. He hurried into the street where the Grangers were shaking with fright, and Mr. Weasley was beside herself, and Mrs. Weasley was beside herself with fury. A fine example to set for your children. Brawling, in public. What Gilderoy Lockhart must have thought. He was pleased, said Fred. Didn't you hear him as we were leaving? He was asking that bloke from the Daily Prophet if he'd be able to work the fight into his report. Said it was all great publicity. But the subdued crowd who headed back to the fireside at the Leaky Cauldron where Harry and the Weasleys did all their shopping. They, they said goodbye to the Grangers who were leaving the pub for the Muggle Street on the other side. Mr. Weasley started to ask them how bus stops worked but stopped quickly after a quick look from Miss, Mrs. Weasley's face. Harry took his glasses off and put them safely in his pocket before helping himself to the flu powder. It definitely wasn't his, his favourite way to travel. That's it, guys. We are chapter five now next week, and hopefully I'll be there in person. Sorry I couldn't be there this week, but uh, just a busy time with all the summer holidays coming up. Start making some plans. I'll talk to you next week. Bye.